Have you ever had anyone say to you, I need to think about it. It's too expensive. You need to run this by my wife. Let me get some stuff in order before I move forward. And I'm just not sure this is going to work. If you've had any of those objections come up on any of your sales calls, this video is for you. I promise you over the next couple minutes, this will be the most useful, tactical, and implementable sales training you have ever seen. So stick with me and let's dive into this. Hey guys, what's going on? Andrea Kim, CEO and founder of Healthpreneur, the world's largest organization helping health professionals and coaches scale their businesses online without the grind. And whether or not you're a health professional, if you are doing enrollment calls, discovery calls, sales calls, and you're dealing with objections and resistance, I want to share with you what I help our clients with on a daily basis to help them become better equipped at having conversations that convert. What I'm going to be sharing with you here is a very different approach to sales than you may have seen elsewhere. I'm not into the, the whole rah-rah, high-pressure nonsense like that that you've seen elsewhere. This is going to be a very logical, psychological-based approach to having conversations with prospects that lead them to want to take the next step with you without you feeling like you're manipulating anyone or sales you're pushing, none of that nonsense, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through the five specific objections that all of us deal with, and I'm gonna show you word for word how to dissolve them. And I'm gonna finish this video by sharing the only two real objections, and it's probably not what you think. So before we dive into that, I wanna just preface this by saying that this video is all about the close. I'm not gonna talk about the discovery phase of the call. I have other videos on our channel around that. Specifically, if you wanna check those out, we'll have a link somewhere around here where you can do that. What I'm gonna be referring to here in this video is exactly what to do when you present the price and then what happens next. So I just want to provide a bit of context for what we're going to be doing here with respect to that conversation. Okay. So it's like, here's the offer. Here's the price. I need to think about it. Talk to my spouse. How do we deal with that? That's exactly what we're going to dive into here. Now, I want to preface this by saying that we help people with coaching businesses. Okay. So if you're selling cars or other stuff, this may be applicable, but what I want to share here is mostly for you if you have a service-based or a coaching-based business. And the reality is that we will only be dealing with people in the close who have raised their hand earlier in the conversation and said, yes, I want your help. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So the only time we're ever really handling objections, at least in the close, is with prospects who have said, I want your help. I know this can work for me. And let's just figure out the details. Okay. We're never dealing with objections and pressuring people into doing something that isn't right for them. So the context here is that our goal in sales is to help people make a decision that's best for them. That may or may not be working with you. So in the close, if someone's at this point, then they have said, I want your help and you know you can help them. So at this point of the conversation, if you let them go, you let them down. That's why improving your selling skills is the most important skill you can develop as an entrepreneur. Persuasive communication is the one skill that will transform your future. And I want to share with you how to do that properly in this video with respect to dealing with these objections. Now, before we get into the objections, I want to mention the five criteria that are required for someone to buy from you. Okay. So first and foremost is we have to be talking with the decision maker. Okay. So checkbox number one, earlier in the conversation, right out the get go, is there anyone else who needs to be involved in this conversation? If they say, yeah, I got to run this by my spouse. Great. When's a better time for the three of us to reconnect? If you get into the close and you're not speaking with the decision maker, you're never going to close the sale. Okay. So the likelihood is going to be a lot lower and you have to be speaking with the decision maker or decision makers. Two is they have to have a strong desire for what it is that they want to achieve. Okay. Irrespective of your solution, their desirability for the outcome needs to be a 10 out of 10. Because if they're a seven out of 10, there's not much you can do to increase someone's desire. We'll talk a little bit about that further on, but they have to really want what it is they say they want. Okay. So that's the second criteria. Number three is they have to want it now. So the timing is really important. If someone's thinking about doing this six months down the road, you're not even worthwhile having the conversation with them. Okay. It needs to be a now thing because timing is one of the things that we very seldomly are able to influence. Number four is they have to have the wherewithal to pay. So if you're asking for someone for $5 and they don't have $5, there's nothing you can get from them, right? So you can check off all the boxes for everything I'm talking about here, but if they don't have the money to pay you, they're not going to work with you. We'll talk a little bit about how people lie to you all the time as it pertains to it's too expensive, because if you think it's too expensive is the number one objection, that is a 100% false. And I'll show you exactly why instead. Number five is believability. 
is they have to believe that you can help them get the outcome that they want. So those are the five criteria required for someone to actually give you money for you to help them. If you check off a few of those boxes, you're still gonna get no's. If you check off all of them, you're much more likely to get a yes. So as you're going through your conversations, you're gonna to wanna to write this stuff down. And if you're not doing so already, pause the video and do so right now and get a pen and paper because I'm gonna be giving you some serious gold here, okay? So very tactical word for word type of stuff. And I want you to make sure you're writing stuff down like the five criteria I just mentioned because if you're in a conversation with someone and you're like, what are the criteria again? You're like, oh, she, yeah. You get to the end of the call and you're not talking to the decision maker, nothing else matters. So make sure you have those five criteria. Cool? Okay, now let's get into the actual objections. And there's three guiding principles I'm gonna share with you. I like to use principles because they give us guardrails or frameworks or lanes that we can always make decisions through. So the first one is that if you're explaining, you're losing. You may have seen some other videos or trainings on sales where a person says, I need to think about it. And then you go into this whole explanation or whatever. Like my book agent many years ago said to me, if you're explaining, you're losing. And I thought that was probably one of the most powerful statements that has stayed with me for the past 11 years. It's so true in sales. And you're gonna see how this shows up, right? So if you're explaining, you're losing. So what does that mean? Whoever is asking the questions is leading the conversation. Okay, I want you to write this down because it's gonna come into the stuff we're gonna talk about when we get into the objections. Number two is you have to expect and prepare for no. If you come into every sale, you wanna set the intention for you know the right vibe, your highest self showing up, their highest self showing up. But also remember like, unless we're talking to friends and family, the vast majority of people's default setting is gonna be no. You have to be very good at expecting that. Don't be caught off guard because someone says, I need to think about it or talk to my spouse or it's more money than I thought it was gonna be. You have to know how to handle this stuff and go into your calls expecting that. Number three, and this is the big one, this is where you'll get the most value out of this training, is asking yourself, what's the real question behind this question or objection? What's the real thing they're hoping to get by asking this question or making this statement? So let me give you an example. Have you ever had a prospect get to the end of the call and they say to you, well, this all sounds great, but I'd, I'd really like to talk with one of your clients first. It happens to us all the time. So how do you respond to that? Let's look at how these guiding principles kind of come into this. Number one, if you get into explaining mode, you've already lost. Well, we don't really give out our clients information because if we did, you're done. It's over. Game over. You're explaining, you're losing. Number two, if you don't know how to handle that, you haven't expected and prepared for that type of objection. And number three is what's the real question behind the question? So instead of explaining, we go into questioning. So a person says, I'd like to talk with one of your clients first. Cool. So instead of making a statement, how do we turn the statement into a question to get to the real reason someone's asking that in the first place? Hey, that's a great request. Do you mind me asking what that'll do for you? You see what I've just done there? What I, it's, it's basically a why question stated differently. I could have said, hey, why, why is that important to you? Or what will that do for you is the same thing essentially, but using what instead of why. Why can sometimes bring up defenses. So using what in form of a question can dissolve that and it's a little bit more of a, a roundabout approach to the same answer. So I'd like to talk to some of your clients first. Hey, fair enough. What would that do for you? Person says, well, I'd like to get a little bit more reassurance that this can work for me. And again, so now we're getting to their their, their buying criteria. We're, we're starting to understand how they're starting to make decisions and maybe why they're not making a decision at the moment. So they say, for instance, I'd like to get more reassurance that this can work for me. Now, instead of you explaining how this can work for them, because you've already kind of had the conversation around this, well, like, well, the reason, like, it's going to work because we've been doing this for a long time and like, blah, 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 blah. No, you're done. If you're explaining, you're losing. Instead, we ask a really simple question. What makes you think this wouldn't work for you? And what this does is it puts the prospect on the stage and now they have to sell themselves and you that for some reason, this is not going to work for them. So you are leading the conversation by asking the question. They are the ones who are essentially like the witness on stands now trying to defend their position. And what we're trying to get to by asking questions is we're trying to get to the truth. We're not trying to high pressure anything into anyone or anyone into doing anything. We want to have an honest conversation where two grown adults are simply sharing their truth. I want to know if you want to talk to one of my clients, what specifically that's going to do for you. Most often it's because they don't feel it's going to work for them. 
cool. What makes you believe that? And then the person might say something along the lines of, well, like I've done stuff like this before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, and it just didn't work out. Hey, fair enough. And I get that all the time. A lot of clients come to us in the exact same situation. But let me ask you this. I'll just use my example as, as if someone were questioning my credibility as it pertains to helping them. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that I'd be in business for 20 years if I was doing anything remotely shady? They're going to say, probably not. And do you think that I would help? I would have helped 500,000 people to better health. I would have become a New York Times bestselling author, been on the doctors, Dr. Oz, and then turned healthpreneur into the world's largest coaching organization for people just like yourself, helping 1,300 of your colleagues build businesses that have generated $217 million. Do you think I would have been able to do any of that if I didn't know what I was doing? So what I've done here, you see what I'm doing? I'm using my credibility, but not explaining it. I'm asking the question. So if you've been in practice or if you've been in business for any length of time, you just use that. Instead of saying, well, I've been in business for 20 years, I've been, I've been like, no, no, it's like, do you think that I would be in business this long if I was doing anything remotely shady? Do you think that I would have all these plaques on the wall, all these degrees and certifications if I wasn't good at what I did? So instead of saying, explaining that stuff, you ask the question. And now they're gonna say, well, probably not. No, that, that, that makes sense. Great. So is there anything else or shall we do this? Okay. So anyways, we haven't even gotten to the injections yet, but I want you to understand to ask the question, to get to the root of the question they're asking, because we have to understand where they're coming from and ultimately what is their criteria that's going to help them make a buying decision. Got it? Okay. One of the things that um, I like to share with my clients is this one page objection handler. So obviously dealing with sales objections can be very cumbersome and overwhelming sometimes. And we basically took all of our best principles and some of the stuff I'm gonna share with you, we put it into one page. It's kind of like a one page cheat sheet that our clients can literally print off and keep right beside their computer or their phone when they're doing their calls. Because sometimes all we need is that reminder of like, what's the first thing that I say, right? And then it just gives you a moment to kind of catch up with the rest of it. So one of the things that we teach our clients, uh, we call it the three levels. And the three levels are when you deal with any objection, right? There's three levels you wanna to go to. Here's the way I look at this. You have the normal conversation and then you reveal the price and then you have the real conversation, right? It's all pleasantries until the price is revealed. I would never reveal price until you've established value because if someone's not sold on your program, it doesn't matter what the price is, right? Price without value, there's no context. And if I said to you, hey, is $5,000 a lot of money? You might say, well, yeah. I might say, well, is it a lot of money for this little wooden chip? You might be like, you're, you're crazy. Yeah, you're right. But what if I said, well, $5,000 for a house? Is that expensive? No. It's all about context, right? It's all about value. So that's why I'm not a huge fan of revealing price before we've shown the value. When you want someone to be fully bought into the solution before we get into what it's gonna cost. Because if they're not sold on that, it doesn't matter what the price is. Anything will be too expensive. So there's three levels. Think of it as your own ground floor, okay? You reveal the price and person says, I need to think about it. Most people say, uh, what do you have to think about it, right? That's just like, I don't know what to do. I want you to think of going into an elevator and going down three levels. You have to hit P1, P2, P3. And if you need to, we're gonna go to P4. I'm gonna share what's in P4 in just a moment. So don't miss that. So P1 is how we deal with every single objection. Rule number one is we always agree. Okay? You can never come to a place of agreement from disagreement. So if someone's like, this is a lot of money, you're like, you're crazy. This is the cheapest thing you'll ever buy. You can't say that. I mean, you, you have to believe that, but you can't tell them that because now they're going to be like, no, you're full of shit. And like, no, you're, full. you're not going to get to an agreement from a place of disagreement. So the first thing we have to do is we always have to acknowledge and agree with the prospect. So how we do that in our world is we call it empathize and isolate. So you reveal the price, person says, and you're like, oh, which one of these options works best for you? They're like, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of money. Whatever it is, 10. So that we're going to acknowledge the first, first thing that they said. Okay. So it's a lot of money. We're not going to say you're crazy. We're going to say, Hey, I understand why you feel that way. 10. So we empathize and then we're going to isolate. But other than the money, money aside, is there any other reason you wouldn't do this today? So what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to show you this, this little connect four type of thing. What we're going to do is if we look at each of these colors, and hopefully you can see this whole thing as each of the five objections. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we've dealt with each of these fully. So let's say that, and again, my little guy has misplaced some of these, so I only have a few. There should be five for each color, but I don't have all five, but just play with me for this. So let's say that blue represents the financial objection. 
Okay. So they're going to say it's a little bit more money than I thought it was going to be. It's too expensive or whatever it is. It's like, cool. I completely understand where you're coming from with that. It is a sizable investment, whatever. So we're going to acknowledge the blue. Okay. I'm going to put this in here. Now, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we acknowledge these other possible objections as well. So we're still at P1, right? Empathize and isolate. We want to isolate the core objection. So other than the price, is there any other reason you wouldn't get started today? They're like, no, it's just, just that. Maybe. Cool. So just so I'm clear, there's no one else you need to run this by? Nope. Cool. And you believe you can show up and do the work? They're like, yep, awesome, for sure. And you believe that if you show up and do the work, this can work for you? They're like, yep, for sure, awesome. And this is something you really are committed to doing now? They're like, yep, 100% now, cool. So now what we've done is we've taken all of the other possible objections off the table, assuming they're being truthful. And so now what we can do is we understand that if they say it's a little bit too much money, we want to understand that we're talking just about this one objection. So we've dealt with P1, which is empathize and isolate. We now know we're talking about the financial objection, okay? Now, P2 is what I call breaking beliefs. And we can break beliefs with really good questions or statements that turn into questions that get people to think differently about their situation. So let's just say we're talking about the it's expensive, okay? And we can ask a simple question. Question. Like, so we've, we've, we understand, like, thanks for sharing that. I understand that the finances or the money is the core issue at the moment. Is that fair to say? They're like, yep. Awesome. Cool. So just out of curiosity, when you say it's expensive, that's compared to what? Okay. We've gone to P2. What I'm trying to get at is we're always comparing prices to other things, right? Price is relative. And all, most people come into a conversation with you and they have some anchor of price in their mind. The challenge is whether you set that anchor or they've just pulled it out of thin air referencing something else in the past. So if you have a coaching program that's $5,000 to help them, let's say, lose weight, and they're saying, it's well, it's it's a little bit more than I wanted to spend. And you're like, okay, I totally understand that. Other than that, 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 that. And I was like, no, cool, just the finances. Awesome. So when you say it's expensive, um, just out of curiosity, that's compared to what? And they might say something like, well, it's compared like, you know, compared to P90X, it was like 200 bucks, right? You know, worked with a trainer a couple of times. So now we know their point of reference, but the challenge is that if someone says it's too expensive, guess whose fault that is? Your fault. Because it's only expensive if they don't see the value. Play with me for a second. So a person's like, you're like, well, compared to what? And they're like, compared to this other stuff. And you're like, hey, you know what? I completely apologize for doing a terrible job at establishing the value here. Because if you saw the value as the way I see it and our clients have, this would be a little bit more of a no-brainer for you. So I just want to make sure that, is this too expensive or is it that you can't afford it? Because we also want to break down the, is it expensive or the affordability piece? Because the, they're two different things. If someone thinks it's too expensive, you haven't done a good enough job establishing value. If they can't afford it, that's an affordability thing. And therefore, the conversation that I'm going to get into with the expensive is different than the affordability piece. Affordability piece might be logistical. 0% credit cards. Can we do third-party financing? Can we offer different payment plans? It's no longer about, I, no, I really, really see the value. I just, I just don't have the money. It's like, cool. You don't need to sell them again on this. Like they're already sold. They want to do this. They just don't have the funds. Great. Let's brainstorm and collectively come up with a solution to help us make this work. Okay. So understanding when people talk about the money, and we'll dive into this a little bit more nuanced in a second, there's two paths that can take. So anyways, I just want to come back to these, these levels and I just, I'll come, I'll say high level and then we'll go into each of the five objections a bit more specifically. So P1 is empathize and isolate. We want to get to the core objection. What's the real thing holding you back? If someone says, um, well, actually, like I do have to talk to my spouse, then you have to deal with that there. And then once you've dealt with that, other than that, is there anything else holding you back from moving forward today? Well, you know, deal with that. You have to deal with each one of these and annihilate them. Because if you get someone off the phone and they're like, I just need some time to think about it, all of these objections are still in their head. And they're going to send you that email afterwards saying, oh, it was so nice talking to you today, but I decided to go in a different direction. And that's 100% on you, okay? Because you could have done a better job at going through discovery. You could have done a better job in the close. You could have done a better job establishing value. And these are all skills you can learn, okay? So I'm not saying it's, it's your fault, although it is. You just have to get better at taking responsibility for skilling up. Because once you know that this has happened once, it's on you to make sure it never happens again. 
Okay. So P2 is we're getting to a level where we're establishing some type of question or statement that's going to break their belief to help them see things a bit differently. If they're still stuck there, we move to P3. So if I'm still having this conversation, I'm going to go to P3, which is going to be about worst case probability of that happening and best case scenario. So that looks like this. Just play with me. What's the worst case scenario if you did this? And they're going to say X, Y, Z. I lose my money. It doesn't work out. Cool. And if that happens, what does that mean? Like, are you still, are you living on a sidewalk in a cardboard box? What we're trying to get them to do is we're trying to nightmareize, if that's even a word, the worst case scenario, and then help them recognize that it's actually not that bad. Like if you lost a few grand, it wouldn't be the end of the world, would it? Like, obviously it would suck, but it probably would, like you'd still be okay, right? And then they're like, yeah, it wouldn't be ideal, but it would, like, it's not the end of the world. I'd still have my health, I'd still be okay, right? Now, let me ask you this. What's the probability of that actually happening? Because you said you're gonna show up, right? Yeah, you said you're gonna lean in for support. Yeah, you said you're gonna do the work, didn't you? Yep, 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 cool. So what's the likelihood, what's the probability of you that worst case scenario happening if you did those three things. And they're going to say, well, it's, it's pretty slim. It's like, yeah, I agree with you. Listen, if I were to give you a book and had you try to figure this stuff out on your own, 100% the probability of not working out might be a lot higher. But I'm going to be with you every step of the way and you said you're going to show up and do the work. So the probability of the worst case scenario is what? Pretty slim? Yeah. Well, let's talk about the upside. What's the upside of you doing this? Let's talk about that. And now here's the cool thing is that when you talk about the downside, it's always limited. The downside is always very, very small relative to the upside. As an example, we had a client came to us at the end of 2019 and he was on the verge of like shutting everything down. He had to take out a $40,000 loan just to survive in his business. He was a functional medicine practitioner and he saw our stuff, came across our work and said, I need to work with these guys. So for him, the worst case scenario was pretty, I mean, he was already on the verge of like worst case scenario. So for him, like worst case scenario is like, we take a portion of that loan that we took out to survive. We invested with Healthpreneur and that's that. But best case scenario, I don't even think he could picture the best case scenario because what happened was three months later, they were doing $358,000 per month. Three months after that, they're doing a million dollars per month. Two years later, they're doing more than $3.2 million per month with our help in our system. So what's the upside? Like shit, it's limitless, right? So if you can walk your prospect through what the upside is here, like, yeah, like, and you've already talked about this stuff earlier in the call, right? So again, we just come back to that. So let's talk about the upside. Like what's the, what's the possibility if you do this and it works out well for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And earlier you talked about how that would impact you and your family and, and, and how else would it help you do what you can't do right now? So we almost go back into discovery a little bit in terms of future pacing. So what we've done now is we've bookended worst case scenario, the probability of that happening is almost zero if they do the work in the context of a coaching relationship. And we've talked about the upside, which is huge. And so then we go into another close, which is essentially, well, sounds like this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And then they might say, yeah. And then it's like, cool, shall we do this? And then you just close. Now, if they're still like hesitating, we go to level four, P4. And this is the magic question. So anytime you find yourself dancing in circles, like you're just not getting anywhere, here's the question to end all questions. What needs to be true in order for you to move forward today? It's such a great question because there's nothing they can say, hopefully, other than the truth. What needs to be true? I understand, I understand where you're coming from. What needs to be true in order for you to move forward today? And they can't say, I need to think about it. It's like, yeah, like I understand that. But what would need to be true in order for you to move forward today? I would need to talk to my spouse. Great. When's a better time later today for the three of us to reconnect? Like this gets to the core, hopefully, of the issue. Like, and ideally we're getting to the core objection, which I haven't even gotten to yet. So remember those two real objections? I'm going to get to those in just a second, but I wanted to kind of lay the land first and foremost with the three plus bonus P4 levels. So uh, let me recap these once again. Level one is we empathize and isolate. We agree with what they're saying and we isolate the objection to, so that we only talk about the one objection. If we have to bounce to the next one, we isolate that one as well. We want to check these off as like having been dealt with. Level two, if we have to go there, is we break beliefs by using a question. And I'll give you some examples of this in just a moment. Okay, so we use a statement or use questions that are going to help them think about this issue a little bit differently. Level three, P3, is we go into worst case scenario, what's the probability of that happening, and then best case scenario. And then it's still, if we're still dancing in circles, we use the magic question, which is at level four, P4, which is what would need to be true in order for you to move forward today? 
Okay, so you got those four levels. Now here's the thing. All of the objections we're talking about in a perfect world would have already been addressed earlier in the call. So in discovery, when you're asking questions and di diving deep into people's situations, you know this stuff is gonna pop up later in the call. So if you can bring it up earlier in the call, if you can raise the objection, you control the objection. And if you can control the objection, you can neutralize the objection. By owning the objection, we take the power of that objection away from the prospect, right? We're not trying to be manipulating here, but we're just trying to have an honest conversation that is truthful and not full of bullshit, okay? So here's the thing. Um, there's five objections we talked about at the start of this call. There's two real objections, but I want to talk about the five, right? One, two, three, four, five, really quickly. And I want to show you the two categories that they fall into. So you have value-based objections and avoidance objections. Let's talk about the avoidance objections first. There are three types of avoidance objections. They are, I need to talk to my spouse, I need to think about it, and I, the timing isn't right, I'll do this later, okay? What those objections are, is they are the individual avoiding making a decision. Now you have to ask yourself, and this is why I'm very passionate about help, like helping you and my clients understand how we as humans think. Why would someone avoid making a decision? Here's the truth. The reason humans avoid making decisions is because we're more afraid of making the wrong decision then we are excited about making the right decision. That's a right or downer. That's one of the most important psychological concepts you can ever understand. We are more concerned about making the wrong decision than we are excited about making the right decision. So we have much more risk avoidance or pain avoidance than possibility for gain. And it goes to every single level of every single purchase you ever make, right? Think about going to Amazon. What's the first thing you do, right? You go to the reviews and you look for that one negative review that just fucks it up for everyone, right? You have 5,000 five-star reviews and one person says something and all of a sudden it's like, well, that overshadows the 5,000 positive reviews because we have infinitely more receptors in our brain for pain and danger than we do for positive pleasure, et cetera. And so what's happening is we're always looking to minimize is the downside. So I'll give you an example. So uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I went to the movies and we had a few hours before the movie started. So we're sitting in the parking lot and we're like, we should go somewhere for dinner. And we're like, well, it's a Saturday night. It's probably a lot of stuff that's already booked up. So we're looking for something last minute. We're like, hey, let's get some sushi. And we just did a quick Google search, came across a sushi restaurant that was close by. And you, you look at it on, on, on Google and it's like, well, I'm not too sure. It looked a little bit shady. So my thinking was, what's the worst case scenario? Okay, so this is how I'm thinking. What's the worst case scenario? We go there, we drop 50 to 100 bucks, whatever it is, and we recognize that it's the worst sushi we've ever had. Am I okay with that? Yeah, because knowing that will save me the uncertainty of ever going back there again. I'll know for sure that I never wanna go back there again. I could also get food poisoning, but I don't think that's gonna happen. That's the worst case scenario. What's the probability of that happening? I don't know, it can be 50-50, right? Am I willing to take that chance? Yeah, not a big deal. What's the upside? We discovered the world's most amazing sushi. It's been sitting under our nose forever and we just discovered it, okay? So we decided to go to this restaurant. And we go there, we park outside, and it's like, yeah, a little bit dodgy. We get inside, no one's in there. That's always a good sign, right? And we order the food, and it's like, without, without a doubt, the best sushi I've ever had. And that's what happens when we make decisions using this kind of logical-based framework, is we look at the downside, we look at the potential upside, and we're like, can we live with the downside? Because the possibility for the upside is huge. So in that case, this sushi restaurant, we've gone back to so many times, we've given them probably tens of thousands of dollars at this point, all because we made the decision to say, you know what, how bad could it really be, right? So, but I share this because as humans and the people you're speaking with, they're very concerned about making the wrong decision. And I wanna share with you why. When people come into your world, there are three different buckets they fall into, okay? So I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of these. Three different buckets they fall into. Bucket number one is I did something similar before and it didn't work. And therefore I'm skeptical. I need 100% certainty that this will work, okay? So that's bucket number one. I did something like this before, sounds the same, it didn't work, therefore I'm skeptical. Sound familiar? Uh, everyone is skeptical about everything, okay? The trust factor in our society right now is, is at an all-time low. You have to be able to deal with that. Number two is I did something similar before. I got some results, but then I yo-yoed. And when that happens, there's, again, hesitation. Is this going to be more of the same, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, we have to be able to articulate our differentiation and absolved past failures by showing them that what they did in the past 
in no way, shape, or form is the same as what they're about to get into with you. And this ultimately, ideally, happens earlier in the call. And the third bucket is someone who's like, oh, I know this already. Okay, cool. So why are we talking? Because if you knew this stuff, you would have the results you want, but you don't, which means you don't actually know it. There's a very big difference between having a couple puzzle pieces and having the full picture of the puzzle. You might have a couple of these pieces, but what you're missing is the full picture. Does that make sense? So when we are dealing with people who are afraid of making the wrong decision, again, we want to get to the core of what's going on there. What happened before? And ultimately, this would have been discovered earlier in the conversation. So what I'm suggesting to you is that if you can raise these objections in the conversation, you'll do a better job of dealing with them. I'm going to just give you a visual. So when the pain of someone's current situation is less perceived than the perceived pain of change that they have in their mind, they are not making a decision. They're not moving forward. When someone's pain of their current situation is massive, or at least relative to pain of change, they will say yes. They will make the decision. I'll give an example. So you've got someone who is deliberating and they're like, ah, I got to think about it. Cool. Awesome. Let's just play. Let's just play a, an example for a second. If someone were to kidnap your kids and the ransom was $5,000 and it had to be delivered tomorrow, would you find a way to come up with that money or would you need a couple of days to think about it? Right? What parent on this planet is saying, I'd probably want some time to think about it? No one, right? Unless you had a kid you wanted to get rid of. So the goal here is to help them understand is, well, what's the difference there, right? We all have the capacity to make decisions, but this leads me to the two value-based objections that we also have to understand. So value-based objection number one is this is too expensive. And if they say this is too expensive, it's that you haven't done a good enough job establishing value because price is what they pay, value is what they get. If someone doesn't see the value, then any price is too expensive, okay? So it's too expensive is a value-based objection. I can't afford it is not the same thing as we talked about earlier, okay? And the fifth objection here, the second one under the value-based uh, objections is they don't believe this will work, okay? I just don't think this is gonna work. Does that make sense? Because if they did, if they don't see the value, then how can they even understand that this can work for them? If someone is not bought into the solution, it doesn't matter what your price is. So we have to understand, are we talking about someone who's avoiding making a decision? Or are we talking about the fact that we haven't done a good enough job establishing value? And this is why it's really important to isolate the objection, the real issue, and then talk about it. So I want to give you two examples here. And let's go back up and we'll talk about the avoidance stuff. I need to think about it. I need to talk to my spouse and the timing stuff. So again, I'll just kind of refer to this one page objection handler because it's just so easy to access. And it just allows us to kind of funnel the conversation into the core issue. So if someone's like, I need to think about it. Hey, totally understand you'd want to think about it. This is an important decision. Other than needing to think about it, is there any other reason you wouldn't get started today? Okay, that's P1, empathize and isolate. Like, no, I just I just need some time to think about it. So I'm just not the type of person to make whatever. Okay, cool. Totally get that. Just so I'm clear, you're okay with the payments? They're like, well, as soon as there's hesitation, there's an objection we're going to deal with. Cool, so let's talk about that. But let's just say they're like, yep, yeah, Payments are okay. There's no one else you need to run this by. They're like, no, it's just me. So we take away the other people, decision makers out of the equation. And uh, you believe this can work for you if you do the work and you believe in what we're doing here. They're like, yep, yeah, cool, awesome. And this is a now thing for you. Like you said earlier, you want to move forward and like actually solve this problem now. They're like, yep, yeah, cool, awesome. So we've isolated all the objections other than timing. Now remember, timing, uh, I went on why I think about it as an example, is uh, not a real objection. It's a smoke screen. If they tell you I'm good with everything else, they're full of shit. They're full of shit. Cool. So I'm just so if, if someone said I'm okay with everything, I'm like, great. Well, it sounds like you have everything you need to get started today. Or am I missing something? They're like, no, I'm just not the type of person, blah, 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 blah. Cool. Listen, I understand that. Here's what I've realized. I've done this for a very long time. And in fact, I used to do this as well. Is I thought that if I had more time, I would have more information. But the reality is all the information you need is from me right here. So what specifically can I address for you that I haven't addressed already? And they're like, no, no, you've done a really great job. At, you know, I'm just not that type of person to think about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Awesome. Listen, I get that. Okay. But again, I've been at this for a very long time and by no means am I trying to have you do something that you don't want to do. Earlier, you said this is a 10 out of 10, right? You know, this is what you want. I know I can help you. And in my experience, if we don't do this or come to some type of decision today, the likelihood of you getting my help is close to zero. And that means you're going to continue suffering. And I'm not okay with that. Are you? And they're like, no, I, 
on Sunan. Cool. So what specifically can I give you clarity and confidence around to help you make a good decision for you right now? And all I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get to the core of the issue. Okay. So what I just did there was I asked two questions or I kind of made a statement, right? You don't need more time, you need more, more information because more information gives you more clarity. All the clarity you need is from me, not by searching the internet. And then I said, if we don't do this now, I made a statement, we're not going to do this ever. So what specifically can I address for you? So I turned that into a bit of an ending question. So I, that's the P2 is breaking the beliefs using what I call truth bombs. So now we're at level three. They're still like hesitating. Cool. Let's just talk about worst case scenario. What's the worst case scenario if you did this, right? They're going to blah, 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 blah. What's the probability of that happening? Da, 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 da. What's the best case? What's the upside? They talk about that, 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 that. Cool. Sounds like this makes a lot of sense for you. Should we do this? So each of the levels, assuming you've resolved to, to a certain extent, that initial objection, you go in for the close again, right? So sounds like we have everything here you need to get what you want. Shall we do this? They're like, well, I feel like I'm being pressured. I, I Honestly, I want to apologize. Please do not take my passion for wanting to help you with pressure. I just know because I've been doing this for so long that if we don't do something today, it's just not going to happen because uh, we already talked about this, right? So here's a visual that I share with my clients. So let's say in the normal conversation, right? The pleasantries, the first two thirds of the conversation, you're having a conversation with the prospect. And I want you to visualize this. You're on one side of the table, they're on the other. You bring up price, and all of a sudden, I want you to see yourself stand up and I want you to walk around to their side of the table. So you're sitting beside them. I want you to visualize yourself putting your arm around their shoulders and you're thinking to yourself and saying to them in your minds, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you to make the best decision for you. Let's figure out how to make this happen. That's the energy and the visual I want you to have as you're in the objections, as you're in the close, because it's not about you combating them. It's about you helping them. They need to feel safe with you before they buy from you, right? And obviously the, the, the first part of the call is massively important for a lot of it as well. But in the close, especially around the objections, they want to feel like you're on their team. We don't want to make people feel like it's us against them. So if someone ever says, like, I just, I'm just getting a little bit triggered. I, I don't like being pressured. I apologize. Please do not take my passion for wanting to help you with pressure, right? And how we say what we say is what we say. So your intonation, your conviction, your care, care plus conviction leads to conversions. If you don't give a shit about them, but you have a lot of conviction, they're just going to feel like you're just trying to close them. But if you care a lot and you don't have conviction on your products, they're also not going to say yes. You have to have care and conviction combined. You get conversion because he or she who cares most about the prospect wins. You only win when they win. But if they say no, when you let them go, you let them down. You have to internalize this. This individual said, I'm a 10 out of 10. This is exactly what I've been looking for. And now they're giving you some bullshit because they're afraid. They're afraid. It's not that it's bullshit. They're not telling you the truth. That's why it's bullshit. But they're not making the decision because they're afraid. They're afraid of making the wrong decision. So we have to make them feel safe. We have to comfort them. But we're not here to make the decision comfortable. We want to make them feel safe. But if they want to grow, they have to get uncomfortable. So in our process, we call this coach to close. And coaching is about asking questions that helps people get past the finish line or gets through their own shit to achieve what it is they want to achieve. And so in this part of the conversation, this is where I lean into a lot of coaching, not advice giving, but coaching. Coaching is asking the right questions that help unlock people's bigger version of themselves. All right. So that's the I need to think about it side of things. Let's talk about the talk to my spouse. So which option works best for you? They're like, probably this one, but I, I really do need to run this by my spouse. Hey, totally fair. I mean, my spouse, you know, would want the same from me as well. So other than needing to talk to your spouse, is there any other reason you would have moved forward today? They're like, no, nope. again, so you're okay with, I'm running out of colors here. So you're okay with the payments? Yep, cool. This is something you believe can work for you? They're like, yep, cool. Um, I don't even know what colors I'm putting in there anymore. And uh, whatever, you know, you can do the work and show up, et cetera. They're like, yep, cool, awesome. So you just need to run this by your spouse. That's, is that what I'm hearing? They're like, yep, perfect, awesome. So let me ask you this. What do you think your spouse would say when you present this to him or her? Oh, they might say blah, 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 blah. Cool. So a lot of times people will say at this point, they might say it's too expensive, right? Or they might say X, Y, or Z. And again, instead of you explaining, we just ask, why do you think he or she might say that? Da, 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 da. We have to coach them through this at this point. This is a very hard person to convert because you're not going to give this person information to then sell their spouse. This is why you ideally want to get all the decision makers on the phone. 
So they're going to say whatever they say. I'm just going to use him as the spouse as an example. Um, just playing devil's advocate. But what if she says no to this? Now, this is very powerful if you're, if you're working with women. A lot of our clients help women. Okay, so I'm, I was raised by a single mom. I have a very soft spot in my heart for empowering women. This is my personal approach. So if I'm talking to a woman and that woman is so-called the decision maker for her own health. Now, this is a health-related discussion, okay? If we're talking about buying a house car, it's a little bit separate. So what if your husband says no, and she's like, well, yeah, I don't think he would. That's great, because it is your body. It's your health. And does he have the outcomes that you want for your own body? And that person is going to say no. Then with all due respect, why would you take advice to someone who doesn't already have what it is you want? Huh. So this conversation in this context, specific context I'm sharing with you, is about empowering the woman in this case to make the decision on her own two feet, to stand in her power, assuming it's for her own body, and to say, listen, I get it, right? Now this becomes challenging if she's not the breadwinner, if she doesn't make any money, and if she's at home with the kids and the spouse makes all the money, it's a very hard conversation to have with one of those, with one person. That's what you have to get both people on the call. But Worst case scenario, you want to get to the core that she needs to be fully sold. And then what you have to do at this point is like, cool, listen, I totally respect that you want to give this a moment with your spouse, but I also want to make sure that he has all the information you need, right? I'm the expert here around this. You've only been talking to me for 45 minutes. So to do the best service to you and him, when is a better time later today or tomorrow for the three of us to reconnect so he can be fully informed to support you in this decision, whichever direction that might be, okay? So the reality is if you're talking to one of the decision makers, you're most likely not getting the close, but you have to be very firm about same day, next, same day, next day, um, reschedule or follow up. If they say something like, well, he's traveling, I don't know why the spouses are all traveling. I mean, even during COVID with lockdowns, like, oh, he's traveling, really? Well, okay, you're full of shit. But anyways, if you see this kind of like flakiness, you have to put up the, the boundaries here and say, listen, like, I'm, I'm just getting a sense that this is this is not that important to you. I'm getting the sense that this is just not that important to you. And she might say, no, no, no like it really is. Well, based on what you're giving me, I'm not getting a sense that it is because if it was a hell yes and a must, we'd find a way to make this work over the next day or so. But if this is going to see that this is going to be something you push out into the next couple of weeks, I just want to be honest with you. I mean, I only take on a very specific type of client who's committed, who does what it takes and is willing to step up. Is that you? Right? Like, and this is where when someone challenges, and this is a big one, when someone challenges you, you want to challenge their commitments. If someone challenges your credibility or if they challenge, if there's any kind of flakiness, you have to challenge their commitment. And I talked earlier about saying like, you don't want to be aggressive and combative, but there's a notion called challenger selling. I'm a huge fan of challenger selling because a lot of the sales that we do is self-identity based. It's coaching. It's helping you become a bigger version of yourself. Okay. So going back to the, the spousal objection, here's another example of something you can use is cool. So you're here, you want to be the type of woman who's strong, powerful, in shape, et cetera, right? Well, if we were to kind of future cast and look at that version of yourself in a year from now, what would that version of you, strong, powerful, committed, healthy, et cetera, tell this version of you? And most likely when they're, when they're thinking from that perspective, hopefully they start making better decisions because the reality is you are where you are based on the decisions you've made up until now. But if you want to go from here to here, you have to make decisions and investments from your future self. So what does your future self tell your current self about what to do here? It's a hard question to ask someone. It's a hard question for someone to be in a position to answer. But I promise you this, when you enroll clients from these types of conversations, they don't get mad at you. This is a very logical selling process. We're getting them to sell themselves and you about why this makes the most sense for them. We're not saying if you don't, you have 30 seconds left to enroll, otherwise the $5,000 discount is gone. Like we're not saying shit like that. It's ridiculous. We want them selling sold so that when they come in, there is no buyer's remorse because they have sold themselves repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And we do that by asking questions, not making statements. So as an example, so we talk about avoidance. Okay. I'm going to give you an example of how avoidance shows up and then what it, what it really is. So there's a call I was reviewing yesterday and one of our, one of our reps was talking to someone and it got to the end of the call and she was like, well, I just, I just need, you know, some time to think about it. I'm like, okay, you're full of shit. And then, um, Anyway, so our rep went through the process and then the prospect said, well, I just don't think my clients are really on Facebook and Instagram. I'm like, okay, so what, what is that objection? What is that specific objection? Now, in the context of what we do, we're helping our clients and build their businesses, getting clients through social media ads, et cetera. She thought she was such a special snowflake because her clients, who are, by the way, women who are successful but don't feel fulfilled, apparently are not on Facebook. I'm like, 
okay, uh, of the 3 billion users, they just don't have, there's not on there, but that's some belief. And she said, I have this belief that that's the truth. And it's no wonder that her business is broke. <laughs> Anyways, so I want to sh I want to show you how this transitions into value based objections. So she started off by saying, "I need to think about it." We uncovered that it's not really I need to think about it. We uncovered the fact that the two value based objections around too expensive that wasn't it. So the real objection was, "I don't believe this is going to work." But the umbrella of "I don't believe this is, is going to work" was articulated in this case as I don't think my people are on Facebook, therefore your solution will not work for me. So what did we do wrong in that situation? Our rep went into explaining mode. And as soon as that happened, you could see the the, the, the facial expression on the prospect tuned out, right? Three minutes, a three minute monologue. And then the prospect said something like, yeah, I understand that, but, which basically means everything you just shared from me for three minutes is bullshit and I don't believe it. And the feedback I gave to our rep was, instead of stating what you just stated for three minutes, we ask one question. Right? So I understand you don't think your people are on Facebook or Instagram. What makes you believe that to be true? Okay. So that's maybe question number one. And all we're doing here is we're trying to unpack her logic, which is very faulty in the first place. And so she might say something like, well, they're very successful. They don't have time. They might scroll, but they may not consume stuff on Facebook. Oh, cool. Um, and that's interesting because a lot of our clients actually serve a similar audience as you. So I'm just curious, do you have data to support that? Or is that just a hunch? And all I'm trying to get at is uncover like the layers of bullshit to the point where she can't keep dancing around this limiting belief that isn't serving her. So I share this because the two value-based objections are the most important because if you do very, if you do a better job in the call at establishing value, then you won't really have to deal with the avoidance or the value-based objections being too expensive or I don't think this is gonna work, okay? Now, earlier I mentioned there are two real objections, okay? So I'm not, I, we talked a little bit about the expensive piece. We talked a little bit about the, I'm not sure this is gonna work. And I wanna finish this off, this video off by sharing the two only objections that exist. And the two only objections that exist are number one, I don't really want what I say I want. So this is about them. This is where people lie to themselves all the time. And this, if you guys watch my videos, you know this drives me fucking nuts. I'm like, if you, if you, if, if you don't stop talking about what it is you say you want, I'm going to throw you through a window, okay? Because if you did want it, no matter what, you would do whatever it takes. So this is the first thing, is understanding that most people don't really want what they say they want, because if they did, they would do whatever it took to get it. And this is the challenge of living in the Western modern world, is most people live an okay life. But here is your opportunity in the coaching conversation called sales to help someone understand that they're playing small, to help someone step into their bigger version of themselves to step into the self-identity of the future self that they want to become. Because here's the reality. They don't want what they say they want because change is hard. Change means uncertainty and humans hate uncertainty. What if I fail and therefore what if I lose status, right? Status within the tribe is very, very important for a lot of people, right? Fear of failure, well, if they fail, then they'll look like a loser to their parents, their friends, their colleagues, whatever it is. So, and it's a shot to their ego. What if I fail again? I've done stuff in the past that didn't work. What if this happens again? And these are things that paralyze people from actually moving forward. So they say they want the thing. It's nice to stay on the surface, but you're not doing anything in congruence with that. So stop talking about it or do it. So that's the first objection. Now this can be brought up in a conversation. I'll show you how in just a second. That's kind of like an unspoken objection. Number two, and this is the big one as it pertains to you and your offer, your product or service, is I do really want what I say I want, but I don't actually believe you are the person or your solution is what's gonna help me get there. And that's 100% on you and your ability to articulate and show value, as we talked about earlier. So we talked about the three buckets, right? People have done stuff before, it didn't work, they're skeptical. They did stuff before, they got some results, and then it yo-yoed, so they're like, how is this different? Or they think they know it all, and therefore, why are we talking, right? So if you get into the conversation, and I talked about level four, right? The magic question, like what needs to be true in order for you to move forward today? Depending, again, not every conversation is linear. Stuff goes off all over the place. And if you can have this stuff jotted down so you can turn to when you need to, it can make a big difference. If you get a sense that you're talking with someone who is just kind of giving you the runarounds and they're not answering any of your questions, 
I like using this question. So in my experience, there's only one of two reasons you wouldn't do this. Either you don't really want insert the outcome or you don't believe I can help you get there. Which one is it? That question cuts the bullshit and gets right to the truth. No, I really, I do really, really want this. Oh, really? Because you just said that you're really busy and this isn't convenient for you. That doesn't sound like someone who's 10 out of 10, I will do whatever it takes to achieve my outcome. Have I missed anything? So when you get into these conversations, you wanna challenge people to a higher version of themselves. So you just have to be delicate with this because how you ask these questions and how you challenge people, intonation, tonality makes a huge difference. You don't wanna come across as combative and aggressive, but you can come across out of curiosity. Or if you take a coaching angle, you might say something like, do you mind if I provide a little bit of coaching? And that opens the door to you telling the truth. They're like, yeah, for sure, awesome. So in my experience, there's only one of two reasons you wouldn't do this today. One is you don't really want it, like the outcome you said you want, or you don't believe I can help you get there. Which one is it? They're like, uh, I really, really want this. Really? Because I've been coaching people just like yourself for a long time. And what I've realized is that when it's a must, we find a way. And when it's not, we find an excuse. And what I'm hearing right now are a lot of excuses. Now you could just stop talking at that point and create silence and space. Or you could ask a question, like, am I missing something here? Or they say, well, I'm not. And just, I, how do I know this can work for sure? And this, like, you have to get good. You have to become very, very, very good at helping people deal with this. I don't know if this is going to work for me stuff, okay? So let me give you, I want to finish with a couple ideas, a couple ways you can handle this. Again, in the context of a coaching relationship where they have to show up and do some of the work. Hey, listen, I totally understand that, right? You, oh, all of us want certainty. We all want certainty in an uncertain world. So, have you ever stepped on an airplane? Well, yeah, for sure. Cool. Awesome. And how did you know with 100% certainty that it was going to actually land at your final destination? You didn't. But the probability was pretty high, right? Yeah. So when else in life have you made a decision? Like when you crossed the road this morning at the crosswalk or the stop sign or at the stoplight, you assumed the cars would stop right? It was a probability play. So you're thinking the probability of everyone stopping is 99.99% based on the fact that this is the rules of, of, of society, et cetera, right? Awesome. But we also know that there are people who run the stop signs and run the lights and hit people and that's not great. But you played the game saying, percentage wise, I think I'm going to take that bet. Fair to say? Cool. So right now we have a similar situation, but maybe you're looking at this as the probability of this working out being a lot lower than 99.99%. Let's talk about that. And like, just put it out there. Have them talk like just what's going on, right? What's going on for you? Well, I, like, and I, you have to get what is important to them here. You have to get their buying criteria, how they're making decisions, what's holding them back. And they're going to say stuff like, well, like, I mean, I did something like this in the past and, you know, it just didn't pan out. And it's like, yeah, I, I completely understand that. And we talked about that earlier, right? How they gave you little to no support how it was a model or a system that you said just didn't make sense for you. Do you see how what we're doing here is different and better and more effective? They're going to say like, yeah, I, I do. Cool. So is there any reason to believe this wouldn't work for you? And they say, no, great, then let's go, right? So you have to be able to lean in and close, right? Because you can't just keep dissolving these objections and then let it go on. Like you resolve the objection. Cool. Shall we do this? We're like, well, like, ah, oh, man, like I'm, I'm just so like, I'm just so nervous. Like I, I just feel like so, hey, I completely understand. This is something new. This is something you haven't done before. And you told me earlier that becoming a better version of yourself, a healthier version of yourself is important to you, right? And that implies you are, you are the type of person who values growth. Is that fair to say? They're going to say, yeah. If you value growth, then how do we grow? Is it possible to grow inside of our comfort zone? No, right? So by nature, if you want to grow and become better, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. And getting out of your comfort zone feels like what you're feeling like right now. And that's a good thing because it means you're on the cusp of making a decision that can change your life forever for the better. And the very fact that you're feeling like this right now is exactly the reason you need to do this right now. Because if this was super simple and you felt safe and it's no big deal, you'd be like, here, just throw it on my credit card. You wouldn't show up. You wouldn't be fully invested because it's no big deal. But this is a big deal for you, which is why I know that this is the right decision for you. And I know that you'll show up and do the work. Am I right? We're like, yeah, great. And I know that you, 12 months from now, are gonna look back on this decision as being the single best decision you've ever made for yourself. I know that because I've seen it happen thousands of times. So shall we do this? So what I've done there is I've leaned in. You can see my tonality. I've leaned in with conviction 
Like I, you have to have the belief and conviction that this person working with you changes their life. But if they don't work with you, like here's the thing is you want to have this detached from the outcome energy. Like if people come to work with us, I know it changes their life and their business. Like they become fundamentally different humans and their businesses flourish. But them working with us changes our business almost to no degree. Like it's 0.001% of our revenue. So if they don't want to work with us, I don't care, right? The, the the analogy of the metaphor I use is the ship has already sailed. Like we're already out to sea. You know that, right? So please tell me why I should send the Zodiac back to the shore to pick you up. And this is where the challenger selling comes in. I'm not necessarily selling. I don't necessarily have to say that to someone depending on the conversation, but that's the energy that I approach a lot of these conversations with is like, I really truly care about you. I re- like, although we may not know each other, I, tr- I care about your situation. I care about helping you, but just understand that I'm going to sleep very well tonight if we don't work together, but you not working with us is going to continue having you deal with these struggles, and these frustrations for a long time to come. And they might say, well, like I'm looking at some other options. Oh, cool. Well, you, this is the first time you're bringing this up, I'm looking at some other options. Fair enough. Do you know what you're having to look at? Maybe I can give some context based on if I know these companies or not. Blah, 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 blah. Cool. Hey, I totally, I, I commend you. You want to make the best decision possible for you. In my experience, yeah, I like I, I like using that a lot. Now, don't overdo that in my experience. Um, I've noticed that if everything you were looking for were here, you wouldn't need to look anywhere else. So what's missing? Well, I just want to make sure like I'm getting the best deal possible. I'm not overpaying. I want to you know, maybe look for something cheaper. Oh, so are we talking, is the money the big issue here? Again, we're, we want to get back to the core of the issue. So let's just say that it's the money, right? They think it's too expensive, i.e. I don't see the value, right? Same idea. It's like two sides in the same coin. Just out of curiosity, are you looking for the cheapest price or best value? And no one's going to say cheapest price, right? Everyone's looking for the best value. So they're going to say, I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for the best value, obviously. Cool, because I'll be honest with you, there's thousands of options out there that are the cheapest price, but there's only one that's the best value. And it's right here, right now. So shall we do this? So see what I, did, see what I just did there is I slow down my cadence. I lean in, I change my tonality and conviction. There's a thousand cheaper options out there, but if you want the best value, there's only one and it's right here. Well, I mean, it is a stretch financially. Hey, I get it. I get it. You can talk about logistics at this point. You can talk about payment plans. Like, man, like, you know, there's another option. It's like half the price. Hey, cool. Why not just do that? Because, you know, if you did, here's typically what we see happen is you end up paying twice. You go for the cheaper option and wouldn't you agree that you always get what you pay for in life? Yeah. So you go for the cheaper option and then several months go by and you're like, man, this really sucked and I didn't get the results. And then you come back to us several months later. Unfortunately, at that point, the price will be higher because we're always updating our program and making it better. And therefore, therefore you will have paid twice. Why would you want to pay twice and at a premium when you could have just made the best decision right now and paid once? and saved all that time, all that hassle. So hopefully, well, I mean, I could go on forever about this stuff. Hopefully you're picking up what I'm putting down, you're jotting down some notes, and I just wanna kind of put a bow on this whole thing. What I've shared with you, those couple conversations, those questions I was asking there, those are kind of P2, right? The breaking belief questions. P1 is empathize and isolate. P2 is breaking beliefs. We use statements and questions to get them to think differently. I'm like, huh, I never, I never considered that. P3 is you play worst case, best case, probability. And then P4 is, well, what would need to be true in order for you to move forward today, right? Worst case scenario, P5, it's like in my experience, there's only one of two reasons you're not going to do this. One, you don't really want what you say you want. Or number two, you don't actually think I can help you get there. Which one is it? And let's just have an honest conversation about it, right? Because the key is always to remember where someone is at in the conversation. You want to read their body language. Are they feeling uncomfortable. You want to kind of make sure like you're reading the room appropriately, right? Whether it's on the phone or on a Zoom call, you want to get a sense of where this person is at. If they're feeling like triggered, just kind of like, just notice that and kind of tone things down a little bit. doesn't mean you give up on the conversation. You just approach it tonality a little bit differently. If you notice something in someone, it's like, hey, I'm getting a sense, I'm getting a sense that you're a little bit uncomfortable. Just tell them like, I'm getting it. I'm getting the sense that you're a little bit uncomfortable now. Did I, did I do something wrong? <laughs> like you just call it out because then they can tell you what's actually happening. And it's like, oh, I, yeah, I want to apologize. Please do not take my persistence, my passion for wanting to help you here with pressure. I just know that like, if we don't do this today, it's not going to happen. I'm not giving up on you. So how, let's, let's figure this out, right? Again, you're on their side of the table, arm around their shoulder, and you're having a logical conversation. The key, this whole premise around all this stuff is we're using logic. 
to help them make logical decisions. Because if they make logical decisions, there is no buyer's remorse because now they are the one who sold themselves on why this makes the most sense, right? So anyways, I hope you found this useful. And there's a lot of stuff we've unpacked here. Hopefully what you're getting out of this is that there's two core objections. One is someone doesn't really want what they want. Number two is they don't believe you can help them get there. That's it. If someone says it's too expensive, you know it's a value-based objection, you haven't shown the value. If someone is not making a decision, it's an avoidance objection. I need to think about it, talk to my spouse, or I'll do this later. They're pushing the decision on something else, on someone else at a later date. And it's because because they want to avoid making the wrong decision. And if you can address that and you can say, listen, like I totally understand you're afraid of making the wrong decision. I get that. What makes you think that that might be the case here? If you can have the courage to address the elephant in the room, ask the hard questions and lean in from a place of care and conviction, you will enroll 50% or more of people you speak with. Whether they just heard about you an hour ago or they've known about you for years, but it takes practice. And it takes a lot of practice because selling, I mean, it's one of those things that's it's confidence and momentum. If you don't have a lot of sales calls, you have to be role playing and practicing. You know, using stuff like documents like this or, you know, mapping stuff out in a Google Doc, really, really helpful. And just repeat this stuff. When I was doing sales calls, you know, thousands of them, so, you know, I was doing four, five, six hours a day when I was starting, when I first started Healthpreneur. And I got into a position where I didn't know how to handle situations. And I was like, I'm never going to have that happen again. So I'd write down, here's what they said to me. That, 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 that. And then I started diving into learning about sales. Then I said, okay, next time this happens, here's something I'm going to ask them. Cool. Next time it happened, I asked the question and then they answered. I'm like, shit, I don't know how to answer that. It's like, okay, cool. Back to the drawing board. Next time they say that, I ask that, they say this, then I'm going to jot this down. And then you just, you kind of map out this like if then scenario. And then you just study this and you, I don't even want to say memorize it, but you become so skilled at understanding what's really happening in the conversation and where you are relative to where the prospect is at and how you can move into the next step that it just becomes part of your vernacular. So I know this is a much longer video. I'd love to know from you in the comments below, what did you find most useful from our conversation today? My hope is that you can take these words, these scripts, these questions I've given you, right? Like you've written them down and you can start to put them into action with your conversations so you can actually help more people. Because if you get people to pay you money, that's how you transform their lives. When people pay, they pay attention. The more people pay, the more they pay attention. And the less they pay, the less they pay attention. No one transforms their life for free. And selling is serving. Get through the mindset. If you have any hangups around selling, I've got a lot of other videos on this stuff. Get through that stuff because it's very, very important. You become convicted in what you can do for someone else and then you bring that conviction and that presence to every conversation so you can create more transformation in, the, in, in this world and with the people that you serve. So let me know in the comments below what you've enjoyed most from today's video. I appreciate your time and attention. It means a lot to me as it does for you. And if you haven't already done so, make sure to subscribe to the channel. We have hundreds of other videos to help you grow a more successful business online. Thanks so much. I'll see you in the next video. In today's business deep dive, I'm talking with one of our community members, AJ, who's having a bit of a challenge positioning how she helps the audience she serves. So if you wanna see how I'm helping her fix that, so she can be a lot more clear, streamlined and specific, and how you can take the same advice into your business, then watch this.